Where is the hand of God? Have you ever asked this question, right? Where is the hand of God? By hand of God, I mean like, you know, the times when you're hoping that God moves in this big, miraculous, visible way that you can see, right? Something's going on in your life and you wish that God would just break in and do this miracle that you could see and it'd be big and it'd be supernatural and be right in front of you, okay? Where is the hand of God? Maybe if you're like me and you've lost a loved one in your life, on the other side of that, you're like, God, why didn't you, why didn't you heal them? Why didn't you, why didn't you come like two days ago and do this thing? And where is the hand of God? Or maybe at work you lost your, your job because that enemy coworker said something about you or they stopped your career progress. You know, something happened and, and you're like, God, why couldn't you bring lightning from heaven? Like just a little bit of a lightning bolt, God, right? Just like maybe on the shoulder, that'd be fine, okay? Where is the hand of God? Or maybe it's one of those months and you're struggling to pay the bills and it's getting towards the end of the month and you're going to the ATM and you're like, God, this would be a perfect time for a bank error in my favor, right? (laughs) Can you put another zero on that bank account? And it's not there. Where is the hand of God? There are these moments in life where we think, That if God would just break into our story, break into our lives in a visible, obvious, supernatural way, that it would help our faith, that it would help our lives, we'd always believe, it would strengthen our faith, we'd be good to go. Have you had some of those moments in life? I know I've had some. I've had a lot. One that I clearly remember when I was in high school, and I was one of those high schoolers who thought there was nothing more to life than sports. That was it, right? I had this terrible back injury, and I was figuring out that it was going to end my, my sports career. I wasn't going to be playing in college. I was barely going to make it through high school sports. And so I remember just being devastated and laying in my bed late at night and praying for God to heal me and the healing not coming. And months like that progressed, and I remember starting to th- think, like, God, are you even there? Are you going to do anything that I'd pray for to hear God's voice audibly, like, boom down from heaven? And it wouldn't. And I was left with this question, like, where is the hand of God? Maybe you've been there two times. Where's the hand of God? Where in the world is he? I want this big, supernatural sign from God. I need this miracle, this thing. I want to be able to see it. If I could just see it, oh, it would help everything. I'd, I'd have a stronger faith. Where is the hand of God? Well, this morning as we get into this story of Esther, we're going to cover the first two chapters. And I believe God's going to begin to answer this question for us here this morning. Where is the hand of God? Here's how the story begins. Esther chapter 1, verse 1. This is what happened during the time of Xerxes. The Xerxes who ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Cush. At that time, King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa. And in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials. So, a little context. A little context. God's people had been taken into the promised land, and they had actually lived there for generations and generations in the promised land. But they kept rebelling against God. And God kept warning them through the prophets, if you keep rebelling, you're going to be Exiled because there are consequences to your decisions, right? And so in 597 BC, the Babylonian Empire invades Israel. They conquer the people. They send the people all throughout the Babylonian Empire. But then Babylon didn't stay on top very long. The Persian Empire actually took over the Babylonian Empire. And now they're in charge, but the people are still exiled. So it's 100 years since they've been exiled. So now it's been generations where the Jewish people have been exiled around these foreign empires. King Xerxes, the ruler of Persia, is ruling from this capital city named Susa. And, And there in that city, there's a small, helpless, powerless Jewish community that's living there in this capital city in exile. And they're wondering, when in the world God, is God going to show up? When in the world is God going to show up? When's he going to rescue us? When are we going to get to go home? When are we going to stop being oppressed? Like, God, what's going on? Where is the hand of God? Why aren't you showing up like you did in the, the Exodus? God, where are you? Where is the hand of God? They felt absent. He felt absent. He felt silent to them. And they're wondering, where is this hand of God? Verse 4, for a full 180 days, he, Xerxes, 
displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and glory of his majesty. When these days were over, the king gave a banquet lasting seven days in the enclosed garden of the king's palace. So King Xerxes throws this huge party for himself because everybody knows the cool kids throw their own surprise parties, right? Yeah, this guy is hilarious. It's this lavish party. Part of it was just to show off his wealth, right? So he's got gold couches, which seem really uncomfortable, right? Gold couches, mosaic floors, and an open bar. And if you've ever been to an open bar wedding, you know how this is going to go, right? Not well. In fact, verse 8, by the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink with no restrictions. So the king is, he's sloshed. The, king Xerxes is drunk in pretty much every scene in this book. And in this scene, he handles himself about as well as a, a sorority girl at a tequila bar on her 21st birthday. And he is, he's a mess. This guy is an absolute mess. And because he's a mess... It's going to upset the entire kingdom. Verse 10. On the seventh day, when King Xerxes was in high spirits from wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served him, verse 11, to bring before him Queen Vashti, wearing her royal crown, in order to display her beauty to the people and the nobles, for she was lovely to look at. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. Then the king became furious and burned with anger. So what happens is King Xerxes asks the queen of Persia, his queen, Vashti, to come down to the frat party that he's throwing for all his bros. It's like a guy's only party. And show off how beautiful she is. Now the text says, come down with your crown, which is very odd. So many scholars actually think that he was saying, that implicit in the text, is that he's giving the command, come down wearing only your crown, right? And so as every wife ever would answer, Vashti is like, yeah, that's a hard pass. I'm not doing that, right? I don't think so. What in the world are you thinking, Xerxes? I'm the queen of Persia. What is going on here? Well, Esther, this book, It's going to go out of its way over and over again to show how silly Xerxes is, how kind of childish and clownish he he is. And so now he's mad that she wouldn't come down and show herself off to his friends. He's, He's angry about this. And so he gets his advisors together to decide. Verse 15, he asks them, what must be done to Queen Vashti? So the men of Persia, get this, they make it about themselves. And they're like, well, if the queen can disobey the king, maybe my wife is going to disobey me. And that would be terrible, right? And so they tell him, there will be no end. Verse 18, there will be no end to the disrespect and disaccord. So they decide that because they don't want their own wives saying no to what they ask, that they're going to actually remove the queen of Persia. They're going to kick her out, which is exactly what they do. They decree, verse 19, let the king give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. And because they had the maturity of me when I was in seventh grade, they say, verse 22, they proclaim that every man should be ruler over his own household, right? So now King Xerxes can go back to partying with his boys. So he goes back, he parties it up, Again, the guy is drunk in pretty much every scene of this book. It's just crazy. But one morning, he wakes up and he has a temporary moment of sobriety. And he thinks to himself, I need a queen. She was actually really helpful because I'm sure not leading anything in this kingdom, right? Maybe I need a queen again so she can do something, right? So, so, so he gets this idea that he needs this queen. So... In chapter 2, verse 2, then the king's personal attendants proposed, let a search be made for the beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint commissioners in every province of his realm to bring all these beautiful young women into the harem at the city of Susa. Let them be placed under the care of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women, and let the beauty treatments be given to them. Then let the young women who please the king Oh, let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This advice appealed to the king, of 
course he did. And he followed it. So what's going to happen is they're going to do uh, Miss America pageant to discover who's going to be their next queen, right? Talent portion, evening wear, the whole thing. I had to Google that because I have no idea what goes into a Miss America pageant, right? But they're going to have a contest to decide who in the world is going to be the next queen. And the great thing is that the lucky lady who wins this contest gets to marry this real gem of a clown, Xerxes, right? So you get punished for winning the contest is basically what's going to happen. So the story here now is going to turn then from comedy to introducing us to our first character, our, 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 our first heroes of the story, our two protagonists of the story. Verse 5, now there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, son of Jair, the son of Shammai, the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, among those taken captive with Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. That's actually another name for Esther. This young woman, who was also known as Esther, had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother had died. So somewhere along the line of that violent, horrible, oppressive exile, Esther's parents had died. And it just so happened that she had this cousin named Mordecai who was in the, the right position and was of the right age that she, he actually took her in and raised her as if he was her father. So this is the real-life protagonist of this real-life story. You've got Esther, this young, beautiful woman, and you have Mordecai, this father figure-like cousin of Esther. Now, the Israelites at this time, they're oppressed. They're oppressed. They've been exiled, right? Exiled for at least 100 years. Esther and Mordecai specifically, they've been taken to this capital city of Susa. They're not being treated well. It's the Persian Empire's capital. Susa is in today what is Iran. The treatment of the Jewish people there was so awful that later in the story, you're going to read that Mordecai begs Esther desperately, like, tell no one that you're Jewish, right? Because he knows what that will mean and how she'll be treated. He's like, do not tell anyone. So they're being treated awful. So the Jewish people at this point, they had been waiting for generations to be rescued by God. Generations. This week I had to wait 10 minutes for dinner at a restaurant. I was like, what is going on? Come on, right? Generations. They would waited generations to be rescued by God. They're being oppressed. They're exiled. They're not in their homes. They've gone generations feeling like God was silent, like God was absent. Generations of asking that question that we all ask, where is God? Where is the hand of God? They're wanting that supernatural miracle. They're reading back in their, their Bibles about God splitting the Red Sea. They're reading back in their Bibles about fire from heaven and clouds and, and God's protecting of his people in big, supernatural, obvious, visible ways. And they're like, I want that. God, where is that? Where is the hand of God? We've all been there. You're in a hard spot. You've been praying. You've been waiting. Maybe not generations. Maybe you've been waiting for a few weeks, a few months, or a few years. And you're asking, where is the hand of God? You want to see that miracle. You want to see that visible thing. Well, what happens in Esther Chapter 2 is going to answer that very question. Verse 8. When the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many young women were brought to the citadel of Susa and put her under the care of Haggai. Esther also was taken to the king's palace and trusted to Haggai, who had charge of the harem. Out of the entire largest kingdom of the world at this time that ruled the known world, there were about 25 million females in that kingdom. And it just so happens that Esther is chosen to be part of this beauty queen contest. And if you do not know what a harem is, ask your mom, okay? Verse 9, she pleased him and won his favor. 
Immediately, he provided her with the beauty treatments and special food. He assigned to her seven female attendants selected from the king's palace and moved her and her attendants into the best place in the harem. So Haggai's this guy, he's this official, and he's in charge of running this thing, right? He's like the reality TV host. He's running the show. And it just so happens that Esther catches his favor. And so he begins to give her all the best stuff, right? He's like giving her uh, bare essentials makeup, and I don't know the names of any other cosmetics, so you're going to have to go that, the stuff, that aisle at Walgreens. He gives it all to her, okay? Or better, wherever that happens, he gives all that stuff to her, and it gives her this huge advantage, right? So she's in this beauty queen contest, and suddenly it just so happens that she gets this huge leg up because she just so happens to be favored by this guy. Verse 10, Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. Every day he walked back and forth near the courtyard of the harem to find out how Esther was and what was happening to her. So it really is like a, a reality TV contest, except there's no TV. So Mordecai's having to come and see the results every day in person. And don't let this detail go unnoticed. Nobody knows she's Jewish. That's going to be really important later in the story. Verse 12. Before a young woman's turn came to go into King Xerxes, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for the women, six months with oil of myrrh and six with perfumes and cosmetics. And this is how she would go to the king. Anything she wanted was given to her to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening, she would go there and in the morning return to another part of the harem to the care of Shashagaz, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines. She would not return to the king unless he was pleased with her and summoned her by name. Yeah, that happened. That happened. Because even the heroes of the Bible, they're not morally perfect. They're like you and me. They're imperfect. So even Esther does this, right? And if you're kind of missing the storyline of what's occurring right here, um, I don't know a great way to put it other than who has seen the show The Bachelor? No, do not put your hand up, right? I'm not trying to embarrass you, okay? If you've seen the show The Bachelor, I've been told that towards the end of the season, there is an episode where The Bachelor spends a night in a hotel room with all the female contests. How in, if you're wondering how in the world that's a thing in 2023, me too. That's crazy, right? That's crazy. But that's exactly actually what's happening here. This is how Xerxes is deciding who's going to become queen. That's the storyline. He's with a, a different woman every night. It's a terrible way to pick a queen. And then whoever he likes best, well, yay, she gets to marry this clown. It's terrible. But, verse 15, when the turn came for Esther, the young woman Mordecai had adopted, the daughter of his uncle Abihal, to go to the king, she asked him for nothing other than what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the harem, suggested. And Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her. She was taken to King Xerxes in the royal residence in the tenth month, the month of Tibeth, in the seventh year of his reign. Now, the king was attracted to Esther more than to any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Ashti. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet for all his nobles and officials. He proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberty. So Esther wins the Miss Persia contest of 483 B.C., okay? She becomes queen. So get this, 25 million women in this empire. And it just so happens that she becomes queen. It just so happens that she wins this contest. Verse 19. When the virgins were assembled a second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. But Esther had kept secret her family background and nationality, just as Mordecai had told her to do so. For she continued to follow Mordecai's instructions as she had done when he was bringing her up. 
During the time Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, became angry and conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. But Mordecai found out about the plot and told Queen Esther, who in turn reported it to the king, giving credit to Mordecai. And when the report was investigated and found to be true, the two officials were impaled on poles. All this was recorded in the book of Annals in the presence of the king. And if you're wondering, that's not the last impalement in this book. So, But it's interesting. Mordecai is in this right place at the right time. You know how you infrequently, that, like that happens in your life? You're like, whoa, he's in the right place at the right time. Here's the right thing. Finds out this, this plot to kill the king, reports it, and it just so happens that he's actually believed, which wouldn't always happen, and it just so happens that his name is going to be write, written down in this book of the history of the king that the king doesn't actually read because he's drinking too often. But later in the book, it just so happens that when he can't sleep, in chapter 6, the king is going to read this book and read that passage, and the whole book is going to pivot off that point that was somehow put together here in chapter 2. Okay, so that's the story of the first two chapters of Esther. So let's come back to our question. Where's the hand of God? When we're in a hard spot, but God's not moving in this big, obvious, supernatural way, Where's the hand of God? When it feels like God is absent, when it feels like God is silent, when we want him to be visible, when we want him to move in a way we can't miss, when we want that that obvious supernatural miracle, where is the hand of God? Well, at the beginning of the story, that's what Esther and Mordecai and the Israelites must have been asking, right? They've been exiled and oppressed for generations. They, they know that there are people back in the day, they can read the book of Exodus. They know that there are people back in the day experienced all these amazing visible miracles, but it's not happening in their lifetime. And so they're wondering, where is the hand of God? And here's the thing. God's hand in a supernatural, in a visible way doesn't move in these two chapters, does it? You don't see fire come from heaven. You don't see the burning bush. You don't see the Red Sea parted. You don't see these visible, obvious miracles in these two chapters yet. He's there, right? There's no voice from heaven. There's no cloud coming down to protect them. You don't see that type of hand of God working. And the thing that will shock you is, did you notice we didn't ever read the name God in those two chapters, did we? Isn't that curious? In fact, you won't read it in the entire book. The book of Esther is the only book in the Bible that does not directly mention God by name. It's curious, isn't it? So why in the world, why in the world does not God not mention his own name in this book that's in Scripture? Why in the world did, not, did God not move in this visible, obvious, miraculous, supernatural sign? Why didn't he do that? Well, here's why. The hand of God does not always produce faith in the hearts of his people. Now, I know that rubs us the wrong way. Because a lot of us, we've been in hard situations, or we have that one thing, that nagging thing that we've been praying about for years, and, it's, and we just think, oh, man, if God were just to move in that thing, if he were just to show up in a visible way, if he were to show up and, like, boom his voice down from heaven and give me advice on this thing, if he did send that at least little lightning bolt on my enemy, right? If I got to see that sign, if I got to see that miracle, if I got to see the hand of God working in this amazing visible way, I'd be good. My faith would be set. Right? Don't we tell ourselves this? That if I were to hear the voice, oh, I'd believe forever. I'd be the strongest Christian. I'd grow. It'd be awesome if only I could see the hand of God. If only I could see this visible, obvious miracle. And yet, in a cruel twist of irony, the very opposite is true. The very opposite is true. Remember back to the book of Exodus. We talked on this a couple years ago, right? What does God do? He shows up and he saves his people in the most visible, obvious way, right? He turns the the Nile River red with blood. He comes in fire and hail, frogs, flies, there's death. There's like, you can't miss it. That's the whole point of the 
Exodus story, you can't miss these, these miracles, these ten plagues. And God rescues these people. And so if anyone ever in all of history got to see God move, that hand of God move in the most obvious way possible, the most visible way possible, it's those people, right? And so then they come out of Israel and they go to Mount Sinai and they worship God perfectly forever. Isn't that how the story goes? No. How does the story go? The golden calf. Immediately. Not only did it not strengthen their faith, the next thing they do is to worship an idol. What in the world? And so God, he, there's this whole thing. that, And then, okay, he's going to save them again. And he, he has patience with them. And so uh, he's bringing them through the, the wilderness. And there's manna from heaven, like food from heaven. Can you imagine? I grew up in Kansas, Kansas City, so it's like ribs from heaven, right? You're just, right? <laughs> That would be amazing if just like ribs came down. That's what's happened. They're getting food from heaven, manna from heaven. And you would think if you woke up every single morning and you had food falling from the sky for just you and your people, that your faith would be good, right? Because you got to see God move every morning. You get out of your tent, like, oh, sweet. You know, you just pick up the food. But what do they do? Over and over again, they refuse to trust God. They can't even enter the promised land. Because here's the thing. The hand of God does not always produce faith in the hearts of his people. Getting to see the huge miracles, it doesn't always produce faith. And this is a constant in Scripture. What happens with Jesus? Thousands of people get to see his miracles, right? And then how many people are at the cross with him? You can count them on one hand. Or think of the Pharisees. The Pharisees got to see these miracles. They got to see miracles that Jesus did, healing people. Does it produce faith in them? No. Isn't that wild? Isn't that wild? The, the hand of God, when it moves visibly, it doesn't actually always produce true faith in us. There's something about us that it just doesn't work like that. There's one time that I, I, I remember seeing this in, 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 in such a crazy way. Years ago, I was a, a youth pastor, and I'd lead these groups uh, to, to Guatemala, which is hilarious because I don't speak Spanish. Um, and we'd have high schoolers. We'd take like 20 high schoolers at a time to Antigua, Guatemala. And one time we would go to this place, and it was a hospital just outside of town. And you can imagine like a huge third world hospital. It was, it was quite literally just hell on earth. It was awful. And one of the wings was for children with special needs. And what happened was, due to the culture and the grinding poverty in the countryside, many times when children were born with special needs and couldn't really take care of themselves, they were left to die by their family. And so people would take these children and then they would uh, put these children in this hospital and it wasn't that much better. They were completely neglected. It was, it was heart-wrenching, you, you can imagine, right? And so what we would do is we would go and we would have our, our, our high schoolers just hold these kids and play with these kids for a few days and, and, and care for them. And a lot of times it was the first time that they had even been out. They, they kept them in these, it's terrible to say, but like these cages. And it was the first time they had been out in months. And so we would just do this. We would, we would take care of these, these children and try to feed them and try to, to help them and care for them and, and love them. And, and so I have this moment that's seared into my memory. And I'm sitting in a courtyard on this brick step, right? And it's this beautiful day. It's this courtyard in this awful hospital. But right in this courtyard, I've got my high schoolers, and they're all starting to, 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 to do different things with the children. And, and one of my high schoolers, he had, he had gone, and he had gotten a, a kid out, and he's just walking this kid around the courtyard for like, like an hour, and the nurse is across the room crying. And I'm like, what's going on? So I go get my kid that's in Spanish for And I'm like, I, I don't know what the nurse is saying. And so she, he's interpreting. And he's like, well, the nurse is saying that that kid doesn't walk, that he's lame. I'm like, what? I'm just getting to see this, this kid that's lame walk. Just in circles around this courtyard, holding the hand of one of my high schoolers. Behind me, there's a, 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 a little girl, and she's having a happy conversation with another high schooler of mine. They're just going back and forth, this great conversation. And the nurse is saying that that girl's never spoken. We didn't think she could speak, right? 
And I'm holding this little boy, and he's in my arms, and he hasn't seen the light of day in who knows how long. And we're just, like, looking at the clouds and laughing. And God was there. Right? Couldn't miss it. Visible miracles happening. It was incredible. It was incredible. And so we go back to the, the hotel that night, and I've got all my the high schoolers around, and all of them are like that. That was, that was amazing. There was, there was something supernatural happening. There was no one that was there that day that was like, oh, yeah, it was just normal, right? It was like, it was unmistakable, visible. You could see it. The lame walking, the mute talking. How could you miss that? Here's the crazy thing about that story. The girl who was speaking to the other girl, the high schooler, she's in her 30s now, no longer believes in Jesus. What in the world, Right? How can that happen? Well, the hand of God does not always actually produce faith in the hearts of his people. It's a wild twist of truth. Why not? Well, here's my theory. When we see a miracle, when we see something visible, it doesn't always ask something of us. Our faith is not necessarily stretched by supernatural signs, just like the Pharisees weren't. Our faith isn't always stretched by seeing God's hand moving because it doesn't require you to step out, does it? You're just observing. It's beautiful, it's awesome, but it's not really requiring you to grow in your trust. So we think, man, if I just got to see the hand of God move, if I got to see one of those miracles, I'd be good the rest of my life. I'd never question faith again. No, no, no. It doesn't work like that. So why does God not move at a supernatural visible sign in the book of Esther? Why is God's name not even mentioned in this book? Why, when you go through this book of God somehow saving his people, he doesn't even bring his own name up? Why don't you get to see the lame walking, the mute talking in this book of Esther? Is this, God's trying to train you to do something. He wants you to find the fingerprints. He wants to train you to find the fingerprints. Maybe you've been watching a detective show or movie and it's like a whodunit. They don't know who did the crime, right? And there's a doorknob and you look at the doorknob at first and you see nothing. There's nothing visible there. And they take a little, the I don't know what it is, right? A little white dust and they blow on it and suddenly you see the fingerprint, right? That's what God wants to do in the book of Esther with you. And that's what God wants you to do in your life. That when you want to see something visible from him, sometimes he's already working and you just need to go find the fingerprints. Because the big signs, they're they're awesome. They're awesome. I've gotten to see a few in my life. They're great. But they don't always actually produce that lasting faith in you. But what does produce a lasting and growing faith is training yourself to find the fingerprints of God to find them, to go looking for them. And you can see that even in these two chapters in the book of Esther, right? Remember all the it just so happens that we brought up as we told this? Yeah, it it just so happened that Esther, though she lost her parents, had this uncle that could raise, or this cousin that could raise her as his own. Well, that didn't just happen. It was the fingerprints of God, right? And it just so happens that after, after, out of 25 million women in this empire that she has chosen as just one of the few hundred to be in this contest. That didn't just happen. No, it's the fingerprints of God. And it just so happens that out of these hundreds of women, she wins the beauty contest. Of course, that didn't just happen, did it? No, it's the fingerprints of God. And it just so happens that she (laughs) becomes queen. And you'll find out later in the story that it was the only position she could be in that would help her save her people. But it didn't just happen, did it? No. It's the fingerprints of God. And it just so happens at the end of the story, what happens? Mordecai is just in the right place at the right time to hear this this thing that's going on, this plot to kill the king. And it just so happens he's believed, and it just so happens they write it down in a book. And it just happens that book's going to be read at just the right moment in chapter 6. But it didn't just so happen. It was God. It's God subtly directing the story. Not showing up in a burning bush. No, no. Not booming his voice down. Not throwing lightning down from the heavens. Nope, none of those hand of God moments. 
And yet, if you just step back from these two chapters, it's impossible to miss God's fingerprints because he's actually got his hand all over the story, doesn't he? All over it. This book doesn't use the name of God because it wants to train you to go looking for the fingerprints of God. While seeing God's hand move in big supernatural ways is impressive and amazing, while it's incredible and an honor, it doesn't always produce a lasting faith because it asks nothing of you. And so if you can train yourself, though, to go looking, finding those fingerprints where you didn't see God the first time around, finding those fingerprints of how God has put things together in your life, that's going to grow your faith, right? Right? Because then the next time it feels like God is absent and the next time it feels like God is silent, you've already trained yourself to know he's not and to start looking for ways that he might already be putting things together for you. You just have to train yourself to find his fingerprints. Where are God's fingerprints in your life in places you haven't even noticed yet? Where do you need to start looking? And you haven't even appreciated yet the ways that he has directed. Subtly, it's not a burning bush. It's not a parted Red Sea. It's not the Nile be turned red. No, no, it's, it's subtle. How is God already putting things together? Where are God's fingerprints in your family? Where's God's fingerprints in your past? Where's God's fingerprints in your story? Where's God's fingerprints in your character? Where's God's fingerprints in your relationships? Where is God's fingerprints in your church? Where can you begin to train yourself to see God at work in those subtle, beautiful, easy to miss sort of ways? Let's train ourselves every day to find the fingerprints.